Colosseum, Chapter 10, Travail Among Serpents Decimus shot up from his seat. Show me, he said. Come, the man said. He motioned upward and they headed up. Not here, not in the street. We must go to the roof, he said. Rather than go through the shop, they climbed a ladder in the back, right by the basement entrance. Decimus went first and then the other two. They hurried over to the front of the building that overlooked a street keeping low. Citizens of Rome walked this way and that, part and parted slowly as Roman centurions pushed through. The crowd parted easily, as they wanted no trouble with the soldiers. They did, however, take issue with those in chains. Traitor! one of them shouted. Fools, you deserve to die, one said, spitting on the closest one. Decimus saw that there were seven of them in chains in procession. Three of them were regulars in his basement. He did not recognize the others. His heart broke to see them like this. He had prayed with them, taught them, supported them. Now their ministry to others was halted. The three of them watched in silence from the rooftop as their beloved family walked by in chains. A few of them had faces stained with tears. All of them kept their eyes to the ground. Don't let them see us, the man said. Quiet, Decimus whispered back. They wouldn't say anything, would they? asked Terra. They wouldn't, Decimus said, sure of it. It's just... He trailed off. They watched the group head out of sight around a corner. They were headed towards the nearby jail. The Colosseum shadows loomed not too much further away. Sadness swirled about the old man as he watched. It's just... He continued. What would we say if they saw us? Would they hope we would try to help them somehow? How, how can we face them in, in silence and do nothing? Indeed, nothing could be done except forfeiting their own lives and joining them in chains, which would help no one. Terra, he said, both of you, go find who you can. Tell them we will not meet until the Sabbath. Tell everyone to stay low, be careful. Tell them all to pray when you see them. He embraced them both and they slipped down the ladder without a word into the evening dusk. Decimus stayed behind on the roof. He looked out over the city, great modern Rome. Its industry, its prowess, its military might, its prosperity, fine fabrics, stoneworks, a place where people dreamed to come. Yet underneath it was rotten to the core. The people had rotten hearts. Underneath the glory of the Romans was their shame and stench. And they seemed to glory in that as well. And he wondered how long it would be so. How long, O oh Lord, Decimus said, looking up at the sky. How long will we wait for you? How long until you avenge your people as you promised? Will Rome overtake the whole world one day? No answer came but a few birds flying by. Decimus fell to his knees. Send help, O oh Lord, send help, he said. He began to pray for everyone he could as the sun went down and night fell. He barely noticed as he travailed in prayer, seeking the face of God, seeking his comfort and peace. Finally he was spent and lay on, down on the hard roof and fell asleep. The stars above and the heavens, witnesses to the anguish below. Sadiki was good to his word, and in short time, the two groups made a camp not far off the road, built a fire, and dressed a young sheep. Bowen had the fire growing, and the mood was light. Sadiki's men and two women made quick work of the meal preparation, and the rest of them found spots by the fire, having gathered a good bit of wood. Bread was passed around as the meal began. Each of the Christians said a little blessing over the food to themselves, having the sense not to try a big prayer in front of this group of strangers. Cold water, spiced teas, and wine was passed around to drink. The Christians turned down the wine but enjoyed the spiced tea. You drink, Siddiqui said, urging them to have some of the wine. We do not drink much wine, Nuncio said, trying to keep it from being an issue. No wine? How can it be, Siddiqui said. We celebrate, yes? We are so grateful, Nuncio said. We are happy with the wonderful teas, he said, as the meat began to be passed around from the fire. Strange people, he said. Romans that drink no wine. Thank you so much for your meal tonight, Baina said, moving closer to him. Your people are wonderful. 
Yes, yes, Sadiq, he said. I bring my best people, he said. Just need to bring more wheels next time. Tell us more about you, Sadiqi, Baina said. Where are you from? We are Turks, Sadiqi said. He told them of his town and the great cities he came from. He dealt the most in livestock and fabrics along with fine jewelry. Jewelry is more dangerous, Sadiqi said. Too easy to steal. And heavy, Baina said. She had her share of jewelry back in, the, in her estate in Mel Melaton. Why you have no jewelry, he asked her. You beautiful woman, I can show you my stock, gold and silver. No, no, I already have too much jewelry back at home as it is, Baina said. You are far from home? Yes, we all are, Baina answered. I am headed to Rome. You are all going to Rome too? Siddiqui asked. They were nearing the Appian Way, a main artery road into Rome. Yes, we are visiting family there, Baina said. Why are you going to Rome, she asked, trying to get him to talk about himself instead. We go for trade. We will sell all that we have, all our goods. The great days of the Colosseum are coming. What is happening there, Canyon asked. Do you know much of Rome? I have been there two times, Siddiqui said. This year they are doing great events. We will go to the bazaar and sell our wares. And we go to the Colosseum to see the shows and gamble. Gamble? Canyon asked. Not well versed in Rome's doings. They have gladiator battles, chariot races, and we gamble. We will win even more money and have more wine, he said, taking another drink for himself. Sounds like many people will be there, Alcum said. Have you, have you been in the Colosseum, my boy? Siddiqui asked. It is a marvelous place, like nowhere else. They will have circus with many animals and stunts and tricks by the performers. You should see the animals, he said. Alcum was intrigued, yet he knew he wasn't going there for entertainment, but to hurry out of there as fast as possible. I have not been, sir, but I'm sure it's quite a sight, Alcum said. A great spectacle, Siddiqui agreed. You should all go. I'm sure it is, Baina said, but I don't think we'll be able to go. You can travel with me, Siddiqui said. We can all go. Bring your family. We'll see, Baina said. Perhaps we can travel with you into Rome. It was not a bad idea. It might give them more cover, help them blend in. I like that. You good people. You are not Romans. Well, of course we're Romans, Baina said. We have a Roman carriage and Roman servants, Roman everything, she said with a smile. What else could we be? You are Jews, Christians, Siddiqui said. I know. You what? interjected Nuncio, hoping to deflect that topic entirely. We're citizens of Rome. Yes, yes, Roman thing, Siddiqui said, but you are Christians. Why do you say that? Baina asked, hoping to defend herself against the charge, knowing she really couldn't. I have met Christians before. They just like you. They talk like you. Good people. It's pretty dangerous to be a Christian in this country, we hear. Bedell spoke up. It's illegal. Yes, yes, Siddiqui said, but I don't tell anyone. I keep your secret. Not one of them knew how to answer. They couldn't directly deny it. Siddiqui knew from the looks on their faces that he was right. I don't like Romans, he said. They are bad people, not good. Many Romans are, yes, Bedell said. They lie, they steal, they don't do good business, he said. Must be tough with them. But you, you will not steal. No, we would not steal, Baina said. We don't want to hurt anyone at all. So, you are not Romans, Siddiqui bellowed with a laugh. It's true, Siddiqui, Nuncio said. We are Christians. Yes, yes, I don't tell. You people help me, I help you. Good, fair business, that's what I like. Do you believe in gods, Siddiqui? Nuncio asked. Bah, gods. Turks have many gods. Yes, but do you have a god, a faith? Nuncio asked. Ah, ha, ha, he laughed. You Christians always want to know. You want me to believe in your god. Well, you've got me once again, Nuncio said. I'd like very much to persuade you. God's over here, God's over there, God's in Rome, Turkey, Greece. I do not trust in any gods. I make money, I make business. 
If I believe in your God, I will be out of business. But, Gutham spoke up, what about when you die? When I die, I die, Siddiqui said. I live until then, I live a good life. Pardon me, please, sir, Guthan entreated him. But our scriptures say that he who has the son has life, but he who has not the son has not life. The son? Siddiqui said, confused. The son of God, Guthan tried to explain. Bah, Siddiqui said, no gods for me. I thank you, other Christians ask too, no god for Siddiqui. Guthan tried, decided not to push it. Well, we are so glad to be able to help you and to eat with you tonight, Guthan said, and everyone in their party spoke in agreement. You don't worry, Siddiqui said. I help you, not the Romans. He took a bite of the lamb they were all eating and sipped a little more wine. They talked a little longer about Rome and Siddiqui's homeland. The hour became late and they got up from the fire. Please, Lady Bena, Siddiqui said, I have gift for you. He went to the large wagon they had earlier repaired and reached in, carefully extracting something. He brought back a dark glass bottle. This is a special wine, my best wine, he said. Special Turkish bottle. He handed it to her. Bena was unsure what to say, knowing it was not wise to reject a gift from him. Thank you, thank you, she finally stammered, thank taking the wine. It's so generous of you. It's not for you, Siddiqui said, addressing everyone. It's for your God. Your God make you good people. I give thanks to your God. Give wine. Bena handed the bottle to Bowen and turned to Siddiqui. Thank you. I pray our Lord blesses you, she said, full of love for the big bearded man. She embraced him, and though surprised by it, he embraced her back. Tomorrow we head for Rome, he said, my Christian friends. They all bid good night and put down for the night. The night was peaceful and the stars shone out over them all. Alcum prayed for Siddiqui and everyone there that night. He prayed the Lord would stay close to them and see them through their trip to Rome. He tried to imagine it from the stories Siddiqui told. What was the Colosseum like? Junia led the group out of the tunnels into the afternoon daylight. Damika staggered out and vomited. I never want to go back in there again, she said. I won't go. It's all right, Baldrick said. We won't. We won't. He did not want to return to those tunnels either. Their sense of safety shattered. He had no other plan. Do you know anywhere we can go? He asked Evita. I, I, I'm not sure, she said. She looked out at the countryside. It seemed so pleasant and yet foreboding. It'll be dark before long. We need to find somewhere to go. I don't think we should go to any villages, Baldrick said. No telling where the soldiers might be. There's a house not far from here, over that hill, she said, pointing. A house? Dominique asked. It's a house. Well, it was. The roof is sort of caved in and the door is missing, but no one lives there. It's empty, Junia said. It may be better than just being out in the open, Baldrick said. It's a start, Evita said. Should we try for it? We can go. Let's see if it's a good spot. Lead the way, Junia, Baldrick said. Come on, then, little Junia said. This way. She headed for the hill, and the others followed. They still carried their harvest of figs and olives and Damika's lamp and oil. They walked without speaking, their hearts heavy with the loss of their friends in the tunnels. Through a small marsh full of birds, they walked, reaching the old house as the day became evening. Baldrick looked in, checking it, as the others waited a short distance off. Light shone in through the failed roof. The earthen house was small, just two rooms with a parcel divider between them and a dirt floor. Perhaps it was abandoned just because it was so small, Baldrick wondered. A few pieces of broken pottery sat in one corner, and a few cobwebs lurked in the corners where the roof still held. Baldrick walked around the outside of the house looking for signs of people. He motioned for the others to come, and they all joined him in the little house. It's not much, but it's better than those tunnels, Damika said. Do you think we'll ever see those people again, Mama? Junia asked Evita. I don't know, Evita said. She was hurting for them. We can only pray for them now. Will praying help, Mama? Junia asked. Will the Lord help them escape? I don't know what the Lord's plan is for them, or even for us. But I do know the Lord said to pray and not faint, so we must keep praying. We must trust Jesus, Evita said. We must not faint. I won't faint, Mama, she said. I'm sorry about all this, Junia, 
she told her daughter. I'm sorry to you both, too. I feel somehow responsible for this. It's okay, Mama, Junia said. But we've lost everything. Our homes, our friends, our hiding place. We have nothing, she said, emotion making her voice tremble. We have Jesus, Junia said. And we have a place to sleep tonight. And food, Damika added, putting her arm around Avita. Food, shelter, and Jesus of the Messiah, Baldrick added. What more could we ask for? Avita tried to smile. Can we build a fire, Junia asked. We better not, said Avita, wiping away tears. Not tonight. At least the skies look clear, Baldrick said. This house would not help much in the rain. Let's make the best of it, Demika said as she settled her things, and they all chose a spot for the night. Baldrick was nearest the door, and Demika was close to him. It always felt better being close to him. Baldrick built a little barrier with a few branches and some brush to serve as a door. He also found a short staff he could use in the event that some animal came upon them in the night. It wouldn't be any use against Roman legions, but his barrier and his staff made them all feel better. They settled in, getting to know each other, and talking about their lord and where they had come from. Baldrick loved to hear Demika speak, and she always looked at him with such kindness. She had a sweet look in her eyes that he could not remember ever seeing from his own wife. He used the oil she brought and lit her lamp, and the four of them talked and prayed into the night hours. When they could talk no more, they laid down and slept, Baldrick guarding the door as well as he could. Morning came on the Roman countryside, and a few distant roosters crowed the group awake as the sky gave its first light. There's water nearby, Junia said. Pass that thicket to the right, she said, pointing. They all agreed to fetch water and then come back to the cabin to discuss plans for the day. Baldrick led them through the brush and to the little creek. The water was clear, but the banks were muddy and marshy, and Baldrick slipped, losing his footing and his staff, falling face first in the mud. Demika tried to catch his fall, but was out of position behind him. She gasped in horror. Don't move, she said, not too loud. A cobra raised up, stretched out its hood, and hissed at Baldrick, in striking distance of his face. Then all the ground seemed to move, snakes everywhere at their feet. Three more raised up, poised to strike. Then two more raised up, hissing at the ragged group of believers. They all froze. Help, Jesus, Junia whimpered.